Hello everyone. Hello and welcome to the penultimate lecture of the course Introduction to Advanced Cognitive Processes. I am Ark Verma from IIT Kanpur and in this week we have been talking about various aspects of cognitive development. Now I have talked about in this week already about biological factors that are responsible for human development, emotional development, motor development, we have talked at length about cognitive development. We have also uh, talked in some sense about uh, you know uh, slightly uh, uh, complicated uh, processes like theory of mind and development of moral judgment etc. Now uh, in this penultimate lecture of the week I actually wanted to take one of the aspects of cognitive development separately and talk about it in terms of how it develops across the lifetime of an individual. The approach that I will be using uh, to talk today is uh, referred to as the lifespan development uh, of memory. So I will be talking about this lifespan approach to development which argues that developmental changes continue beyond the young adulthood and people keep changing and adapting through their entire lives. Now the lifespan approach to development uh, can be contrasted with you know typical notions about development where it is believed that uh, the entire physical and cognitive maturation of the individual uh, kind of you know culminates and uh, you know reaches its peak around the young adulthood time and there are not m major or significant changes that are going to come after that age onwards. In uh, contrast, the lifespan approach uh, to development of any uh, aspect of uh, human development and we are talking about memory today is the fact that you track the changes that happen with respect to the particular ability that you are trying to uh, you know uh, work with and see how it changes across uh, the lifetime of an individual. Uh, for example, we will talk today about how memory uh, you know develops, uh, how the skills about memory develop from very young children, from 3 days to few months old children to you know senile population to elderly people 60, 70, 75 year old individuals and we will see what changes uh, come in this component of memory, how do people adjust to the uh, coming changes, what are the strategies they use to remember stuff and how do they organize information, what are the other skills that might help people to really you know uh, kind of keep track of their memory abilities. Uh, let us uh, move slightly further. So earlier it was believed and psychologists believed that infants around 4 months of age could not remember much, could not remember anything for more than a very brief period of time. Now this finding could also be a result of the kind of testing methods that were available then because more recently uh, developmental psychologists have come up with new ways to test the infant's ability to memorize people and object and they have basically uh, opined for the fact that around 6 month old infants can actually create association between objects even though they have not really seen those objects presented before uh, together at the same time. So there are uh, cases being made, the, the research is suggesting that uh, uh, cognitive psychologists might have underestimated uh, the you know the level of skill that children would have with respect to memory uh, you know at the given age. So let us kind of move uh, slightly further uh, from there when you talk about memory when you talk about say for example what are the things that the child would uh, you know uh, need uh, how would the child attend uh, to learning and acquiring uh, new information. So attention patterns basically is a very important component. So the thing that the child pays attention to, if you remember I was talking to you about this a little bit when I when we were discussing about language acquisition. Uh, the child has to pay you know a lot of attention to whatever uh, speech stimuli are going around the child, uh, whatever intonations are being used with what kind of emotional expression somebody is speaking uh, whatever sentence and what the child is doing is the child is paying attention to all of these signals even though he is not really understanding it in uh, one sense of the word but the fact is that the child is a very attentive listener and the child is processing all of this information. Similarly, this attention that the child is applying to his or her environment to whatever is being said or done around the child is very important for the child to basically acquire or learn new material and it is in that sense a very important aspect, a very important ability that could contribute to uh, say for example children's memory. Researchers uh, have uh, nowadays can measure infant's memory by noticing how long they spend uh, paying attention to particular stimuli that can be one of the ways if you remember we were talking about habituation and dishabituation uh, when we were talking about language acquisition. So if the child is uh, you know is uh, getting uh, familiar if the child recognizes particular things then the child will not need to pay a lot of attention to that same thing again and again. So this is uh, one of the ways that uh, researchers who work with uh, very young children, infants for that matter, uh, use to infer whether the child has acquired or remembered something or not. 
A very good uh, demonstration of this one could be actually seen in uh, Sangrigoli and Dishkorin's uh, study, uh, where they wanted to test children uh, for the own race bias. Now, own race bias in memory is basically it refers to the tendency of people to recognize members of the same ethnic group uh, more accurately in comparison to members of other ethnic groups. So, Caucasian children are given a task. Uh, to remember Caucasian faces, to memorize Caucasian faces versus to memorize uh, say for example African American faces, then you would see that generally these children would probably uh, you know recognize faces, white children, Caucasian children would recognize faces of Caucasian uh, people um, slightly better than they would recognize the features of the African American people. Now, it is just an example, the study in question here basically compared 3 month old white uh, babies, uh, Caucasian babies and they showed them pictures of white women and Asian women and the idea was they would present these pictures to the child uh, repeatedly again and again till the amount of time that the child looked at the picture for uh, reduces to almost half. This logic basically says that because now the child has memorized and the child knows that you know this is a familiar face, the child really does not want to spend much time on that. Okay? Children are in, in some sense uh, slightly miserly about how they are uh, you know, going to use their resources. Now, in this study, researchers presented a pair of photos side by side. There was one familiar photo and a photo of an unfamiliar woman from the same racial category. So, some testing was done, they were made familiarized with some photos and then a familiar photo and an unfamiliar photo from either the same racial category or a different racial category could be presented. The results showed that babies who had initially seen a white woman and had gotten familiarized later looked longer at the unfamiliar white woman than at the familiar white woman. So, the idea is because they had been familiarized with this thing, they are not really going to take uh, you know spend a lot of time looking at these pictures, they are going to look slightly longer at the unfamiliar white women. These data indicate that the babies could certainly tell the difference between familiar and unfamiliar white faces. Further, uh, babies who had initially seen an Asian uh, woman, remember we are talking about uh, white babies, babies who had seen an, uh, initially an Asian woman later looked equally at the familiar Asian woman and the unfamiliar Asian woman. Why is this happening? Because they are probably not being able to memorize the features of the Asian face as well as they were able to memorize the uh, features of the uh, white American face. So, that is basically uh, the demonstration of that the fact that own race bias exists, but it actually is more of a, you know more of a demonstration about uh, that babies uh, you know even at around 3 months of age can start remembering faces. Let us talk about a different kind of memory again uh, when we are talking about infants. So, recognizing a mother research on visual recognition shows that even 3 day old infants can distinguish their mother's face from a stranger's face that is something uh, slightly remarkable. Uh, also, infants ability to recognize their mother's voice especially remarkable. Zilevsky uh, and colleagues in 2003, they tested infants about one or two weeks even before they were born. So, in the last uh, couple of weeks of, of the pregnancy and they observed that the infant's heart rate changed more when hearing uh, uh, the mother's voice than when hearing an unfamiliar stranger's voice. So, already you can see that even before the child is born, the child has acquired a degree of familiarity with the mother's voice as compared to the voice of somebody else. Now, there is this uh, very interesting technique that uh, people have used to uh, kind of check uh, whether children have memorized something or not. So, this one is referred to as the conjugate reinforcement technique. Now, in the conjugate reinforcement technique, what happens is that there is a mobile uh, that hangs over an infant's crib and there is a ribbon that connects the infant's uh, ankle and uh, the mobile stand. So, the idea is whenever the infant is going to move his or her feet, the mobile uh, is basically going to move, you know, there is going to be motion. Now, after several uh, minutes after this training is done, after several minutes, 2 to 6 month old infants, they start to kick rapidly and pump up the movement of the mobile and then lie quietly and watch parts of the mobile move. Now, I am not really referring to a mobile phone here, I am referring to something that kind of moves over the cribs, uh, over the infant's crib. Now, so uh, after several uh, minutes, 2 to 6 months old infants can begin to learn the fact, they can begin to appreciate the fact that as soon as they kick, the mobile starts to rotate. So, they will kick for a time, uh, once the movement is initiated, they will kind of lay back and watch its movement and that is uh, that's a very interesting play idea as well. 
Now, uh, they use this technique of conjugate reinforcement to assess the infant's memory. Now, what they do is they do all of the initial training and testing at the baby's home in the baby's own crib so that none of the reactions that the baby is going to make are basically because they are unfamiliar with the surroundings. Initially, what they do is they give a three minute period at the beginning of the first session. Uh, the researcher kind of already takes a baseline measure, how much that, uh, you know, how many movements or how many kicks the child is making anyways. Uh, during this time, the ribbon is connected from the infant's angle to an empty mobile stand. So there's just the stand, there's nothing that is going to move and attract the child's attention. Thus, the experimenter can now measure the amount of spontaneous kicks, how much ever the child is kicking and they, uh, and they just note it down as a comparison uh, to be made later. Now, the experiment moves the ribbons. Uh, the next thing that, they, uh, that this one does is that they can kind of measure the amount of spontaneous kicking uh, and then they be, uh, basically before the infant starts to uh, move the mobile. Later what they do is, they move the ribbon so that it turn, uh, runs from the baby's angle to the stand in which now the mobile is hung. So they kind of connect these two things. The babies are allowed around 9 minutes to discover that when they kick, it activates the movement of the mobile and this is basically referred to as the acquisition phase. So now the baby has learnt the fact that when I will kick, the ribbon will actually let the mobile move. The infants basically receive these uh, two training sessions typically around uh, 24 hours apart from each other. At the end of the second session, the ribbon is unhooked and returned to the empty stand for three minutes. Now, again, it's uh, the mobile is moved and the ribbon is tied to the empty stand in order to measure whether the infants remember that they have to make this movement, make this kicking movement to start the revolution. Researchers then measure long-term memory uh, after one to 40 days, uh, 42 days have elapsed. After the elapsed time, the mobile is uh, hung again above the infant's crib with the ribbon hooked to the empty stand. So that's uh, done. If the infant recognizes the mobile and recalls how kicking had produced movement, then he or she would soon produce that foot kick re response to make the mobile turn. Rovi Collier, who uh, actually was doing this research, devised an innovative way to check whether infants actually remembered how to activate the mobile. She also devised an objective method for assessing the long-term memory as she could now compare two measures. They were taking two measurements. First was the number of kicks produced in the retention test without the time being elapsed and the number of uh, kicks after particular time has elapsed. So they have two uh, uh, tests uh, available. They later also devised a second operant conditioning task which is more appealing to infants slightly older 6 to 18 months old infants and in this task what was happening was the infants had to learn to press a particular lever so that a train uh, um, uh, you know a toy train could move uh, around a per circular track. Now they had these two tasks and they could compare the findings from these two tasks to trace infant memory from as early as 2 months to as late as 18 months of age. You can see here uh, if you compare the mobile task and the train task, you can see that two to six month old infants already kick to act, uh, activate a mobile and six to 18 month old infants, they press a lever to activate it. And you can see that the amount of retention that's around, around uh, the age of six months, they could already retain this idea of uh, uh, kicking to produce the mobile movement for around up to two weeks. Okay, then you see that as the age in months increases, the amount of retention uh, goes from, you know, starting from two weeks to up to 13 weeks in the train task. So, this basically says the memory uh, or uh, the memory uh, of the child in doing particular uh, things is increasing and the amount of retention is increasing over time. And it's almost a steady and linear improve during the first 18 months of life. Further, Rovi Collier and uh, colleagues demonstrated that infants and adults' memories has a very, uh, you know, has uh, quite a number of similarities. For example, infants also remembered better with distributed practice. You give a, a person, you know, uh, an adult, 18 year, 20 year, 25 year old person, you give them a list to remember and you ask them that, you know, you memorize this uh, directly, all of this much in just this much, li this little time and come back and I'll take a test you will see that they perform rather poorly. But if you give them uh, some material and you ask them to you know, study it in separate batches, you study this for one hour, take rest, then study uh, this another material for one hour, take rest, then study another material for, uh, for one hour and take rest. Then if you take the you know, test of recall, you will find that they have done better. Infants also uh, basically work like that. They also remember better with distributed practice. 
it's not really a great idea to make them learn everything at one go. Infants show as uh, well as adults uh, the levels of processing effect. If you remember Craig and Tulwing, and I've talked about this in the course on MEM, uh, in the in the last course, basic uh, cognitive processes, when we've talked uh, about memory in much detail, uh, that. Uh, in infants also, there is better recall for items that are processed at a deeper level. Just to remind you, uh, a shallower level is basically when you are just looking at the physical uh, structure, say for example, the sound and uh, you know the number, etc. The deeper level is when the infant or when the child is started appreciating the meaning, uh, started appreciating how to use that information, that is a deeper level. So if they process something to a deeper level, they learn to use something, they learn a skill for example, the kicking uh, or the pressing lever thing, they will remember it much better better as compared to uh, if it is just uh, you know information about uh, how a sound is like and those kind of things. Now let us talk about memory in children, we have kind of moved slightly away from infants, let us talk about slightly older children and you know memory is basically uh, at least two major components, working memory, different components therein and uh, long term memory. Now uh, let us talk about, talk a little about working memory. Uh, memory spans uh, basically improve dramatically during childhood. According to research evidence, a two-year-old can recall about an average of two numbers in a row, whereas nine-year-olds can already recall around six uh, numbers in a row. So the, the, you think uh, you think that the span uh, of memory is increasing with age. Children with high scores on phonological working memory, a component of working memory, are likely to excess in re uh, likely to excel in reading, writing, and listening language related tasks, whereas children who have a higher score on visual spatial working memory, the manipulation of information, shapes and figures, etc., they are much likelier to excel in mathematics. So you can see uh, the relative contribution of the kinds of skills that the children will be good at and might lead to them being good in particular aspects of their studies. When you talk about long term memory, children uh, typically have excellent recognition memory, but they have a rather poor recall memory. In a test of recognition, researchers presented two and four year children with around 18 objects and they later presented a mix of 18 older objects that they had already presented and 18 newer objects. What they find is that two year olds recognize an impressive 80 percent of the items, whereas four year olds recognized about 90 percent of the items. So you see again there is this increase in uh, recall with age. In another study, Myers and Perlmutter, they tested different groups of children for their ability to recall a set of nine objects. The two-year-olds recalled only about 20 percent of the items, of the 20 percent of the nine objects, whereas the four-year-olds uh, recalled around 40 percent of the nine objects. So you see, it is almost linear with age. Now, a very important aspect of memory performance or even our memory performance or children's memory performance in general is what are the strategies you are using to learn particular material, that is a very very important aspect. So memory strategies in that sense are very crucial to somebody's memory performance eventually. Memory strategies, just to define it for you, are intentional goal oriented activities that we use to improve our memory. Suppose for example, children and uh, even adults for that matter, they learn information with the goal of using it somewhere. For children it is performance in school tests, classes, etc. For adults it might be to use uh, somewhere, to use it as an argument, to use it to do something. Now young children do not always realize that strategies can be useful, they do not appreciate the use and the kinds of strategies that might be available to them to uh, you know learn uh, particular material uh, better. Some children may not use these strategies effectively and this is a big problem, this is referred to as the uh, problem of utilization deficiency. They are not really bad at their memory, their memory is not really bad but they are not either aware of the strategies that can be used. Also, they are not really using those strategies effectively and consistently. Older children, however, uh, typically realize that strategies are very useful. In addition, they choose their strategies more carefully and use them consistently. You can kind of link it with their school performance. The school is getting tougher, expectations to learn information is there, uh, there is this pressure to retain as much as possible. Children already start figuring out ways of remembering and retaining information and in that process they start using strategies, start you know hit in trial, uh, use this strategy, use that strategy and then plan carefully that okay this one works best for me or this one works best for me. Uh, older children also often use a variety of strategies, so they can kind of as I was saying, they kind of choose between the number of strategies available to them. Now 
the amount of information that you will remember also depends upon the kind of rehearsal that you are going to engage in. So researchers suggest that four to five year olds do not really spontaneously rehearse material they want to remember. So they don't really have this, you know, this idea of strategy. Uh, however, uh, seven year olds, uh, you know, they use, uh, they do use rehearsal strategies. By the time they are five, six, seven years old, they do use uh, strategies and they often silently rehearse uh, several words, you know. By seven year old, uh, you might at least be re uh, required to start remembering, you know, nursery rhymes and those kind of things. And this is where you will see that children are kind of, you know, repeating things, mumbling them uh, in their mouth so that they can recall this kind of information. Young children often benefit with their rehearsal strategies, even though they do not use these strategies spontaneously, they have to be instructed, they have to be helped to start using these strategies, but once they use, start using these strategies, they do benefit from, uh, you know, uh, these uh, strategies. There could be organizational strategies as well that might help the memory performance of individuals. Morley and colleagues in 1969, they demonstrated in a study in which children studied, uh, you know, they looked at pictures from four categories, animals, clothing items, furniture and vehicles. During the two minute study period, they were told that they could organize and rearrange these pictures in whichever, they they, uh, whichever way they wanted. This arrangement could actually help them recall stuff uh, better. If you remember in the memory chapter, we talked about that if you start classifying uh, things in categories, you might be able to retain them better. But young children could rarely move the pictures next to each other, uh, you know, they could not bring similar pictures together. Older children, however, appreciated the rule and they frequently organized the pictures into these different categories. Talking about imagery, sometimes imagery is a good way to retain information. If you remember how people would uh, memorize cognitive maps uh, or general, you know, how people would recognize, uh, uh, you know, uh, paths or routes or, uh, you know, layouts of uh, places, uh, use of imagery is, is very helpful for retaining information in memory. However, it's, it's seen that it's not really research evidence does not suggest that people use it uh, so liberally. Spontaneous use of imagery does not even develop till until adolescence, even though even most college students, they do not really use uh, imagery as a strategy uh, often enough to remember information. So, uh, all in all, as children develop, they learn to use a variety of memory strategies in a more careful and consistent, uh, consistent fashion and that already reflects in their memory performance. Now, let me talk to you a little bit about some applied aspects of children's memory, so eyewitness testimony. Researchers have employed, uh, have implied that older children uh, provide much more accurate eyewitness testimony than younger children. Also research confirms that the accuracy of younger children's uh, eyewitness testimony is often influenced by the child's age, stereotyping and misleading suggestions. Now uh, we've talked a little bit about children's memory, aspects of children's memory. Now let us move to the memory aspect of elderly people. You know, this is the lifespan development approach that we are following. So, I've kind of already given you a brief survey of what kind of memory abilities are there in children. Let us now survey briefly what are the memory abilities of elderly people. Stereotypes about elderly people often refer to them as being typically forgetful and, always, and also cognitively incompetent at times. Research on age-related uh, changes in memory point to a picture that suggests larger individual differences and complex developmental trends in various components of memory. So the picture is not really clear. You, you cannot really definitively say that there is a significant decline in adults' memory, in elderly people's memory, uh, unless, uh, you know, they are suffering from a disease like Alzheimer's or dementia or those, those kind of things. Uh, people who are developing uh, normally and, uh, you know, they have no diseases and they have, uh, have a significant degree of education, it, uh, research has shown that it does not really impact their memory so much. Let's talk about working memory. Uh, research uh, indicates that there are age similarities in performance and tasks that are relatively straightforward and require simple storage. However, age differences are observed in complicated tasks that require manipulation of information. If you are, uh, you know, if you have, if you are doing a working memory task, say for example, the end back task, you have to remember something that came on two trials back or four trials back or six trials back. Young and older adults perform similar, uh, similarly on, uh, uh, you know, simpler tasks like digit span tasks, uh, where, you know, you just have to recall the numbers in serial order, but age difference are substantial on a working memory task where they have to keep some distractors away uh, or perform two tasks simultaneously, task switching kind of scenarios. Another example, 
Stein and colleagues have tested people's uh, recall for spoken English and there were two conditions. In one condition, the sentences were spoken in uh, the correct order, normal syntax and at normal rate of speech. Here the performance of adults and uh, elderly people and young adults was the same, but when uh, the there was, uh, you know, when the syntax was jumbled, the words were in jumbled order and they were being spoken at a faster rate, uh, the young adults performed much better than the elderly individuals. So you can see that if as the task gets more complex, there in uh, there is where you can start seeing you know the difficulties in memory talking about long term memory in elderly people so long term memory basically includes a few things it includes uh, semantic memory how they are going to use memory etc one of the aspects of long term memory is prospective memory that is remembering to do something in the future lists to do lists uh, you know go and do this and come back and these kind of things older individuals generally have difficulty on many prospective memory tasks for example, in a task where individuals were asked, uh, you know, required to memorize a shopping list, something that they would have to buy from a, a you know, marketplace later, young in the, uh, younger adults uh, uh, completed a greater number of uh, tasks uh, than the older adults. Implicit memory. Implicit memory basically involves uh, where there is no explicit recall in, uh, required, but you have to do a task that involves memory of the previously learned information. Now, Light and colleagues measured implicit memory in terms of the time that the participant required to read a letter sequence that was either familiar or unfamiliar. If they could read the letter sequence fast, it did kind of indicated memory. So, uh, basically when they did this task, adults between the ages of 64 to 75, uh, 78, they performed uh, relatively well as well as the younger adults who, kind, who were between the ages of 18 to 24. On other research as well, implicit memory shows either similar performances by adults and uh, elder adults and uh, younger adults or else just a slight deficit for the older adults. So in tasks of implicit memory, you see that there is almost no difference between how elderly people perform and how young people perform. Explicit recognition memory, a number of research findings have uh, converged on the fact that long term recognition memory where explicit recognition is required either declines slowly or not at all as people are growing older. So two kinds of things are possible. In one of the studies they did, a recognition memory uh, task, uh, they found that 20 year olds correctly recognize around 67 percent of the words that had been presented earlier, and, but that 70 percent of the old, uh, or 70, uh, 70 year olds recalled around 66 percent of the words. So there is almost no decline here. Uh, but if you talk about, this one was about explicit recognition memory. Okay, uh, this one is about explicit recall memory. Now, explicit recall memory basically uh, shows a lot of age differences. The, they are very marked age differences. In a study by Dunlosky and Herzog, uh, when participants were asked to recall pairs of unrelated English words, 20-year-old participants recalled an average of 20% 20, 20 more than the 70-year-old participants. However, elderly individuals also differed widely in their performance on long-term recall tasks. For example, uh, people who would have low verbal ability and little education are especially likely to show a decline, but people who have decent education and they are, uh, you know, having good verbal ability, uh, they can basically show minimal age differences. They kind of perform at par with the younger adult individuals. That was something I was saying in the beginning of the class. Explanations, you know, why are these age differences being observed? Let us talk a little bit about what could be the cause of these age differences between, you know, uh, young adults and older people. Research in cognitive neuroscience demonstrates that, you know, there are changes in brain structure happening during normal aging. These changes in the brain structure and these includes areas in the frontal and parietal regions of the cortex and uh, uh, very many subcortical structures. As these parts work together in a coordinated fashion and say for example, if one of the part is getting slightly tired or damaged, let us say, explicit recall memory can be severely disrupted even if one of these components is not really functioning properly. The pattern of changes in memory performance during normal aging can therefore be in, uh, explained using a few strategies. Let us see what are the strategies. First is that elderly people uh, report uh, starting to having trouble, uh, you know, paying attention. Elderly people often comment that they have more difficulty concentrating on a task nowadays or paying attention. In fact, when elderly adults work on a standard memory task, they perform uh, about the same as when uh, young adults uh, work on a task uh, which requires divided attention. So it's, it, it kind of tells you that in the elder people's attentional resources are almost half of the attentional resources of the younger adults. 
ineffective use of memory strategies i was uh, referring to using memory strategies to um, uh, you know to boost your memory performance earlier now elderly people uh, could basically have uh, impaired memory because they uh, kind of you know use memory and they kind of you know use memory strategies and meta memory uh, less effectively i'll uh, kind of uh, uh, talk about meta memory in more detail in just a bit Research suggests that elderly adults they construct fewer chunks in working memory as compared to older adults. This, this could be just one corroborating evidence uh, of the fact that they're not really using memory strategies properly. Uh, there's another uh, hypothesis, the contextual cues hypothesis. Elderly people perform relatively well on recognition tasks because contextual cues are present on the recognition tasks itself. In contrast, contextual cues are absent on explicit recall tasks which require people to use uh, effortful and deliberate processing. Younger adults are relatively skilled in remembering contextual cues such as uh, where they were and where, what date it was, what were they doing when they heard a particular news item, but older people, elder uh, individuals might have, a might have a problem with invoking these contextual cues and hence they would uh, end up uh, you know, uh, performing slightly poorly on these kinds of memory tasks. Finally, you could refer to cognitive slowing. Elderly uh, people often experience cognitive slowing or a slow rate of responding to cognitive tasks. So this could just be a response thing, uh, which is basically reflecting in their performance on these kind of tasks. Now, in summary, uh, we do have several hypotheses that explain uh, some portion of the memory uh, differences that happen between younger and older adults. Now, we've, I was referring to something like meta memory a bit uh, ago. Uh, this is the time to start talking a little bit uh, in more detail about this. Now, there are two aspects of metacognition, meta memory and meta comprehension. Meta memory is basically realizing that you need to organize this information in a particular way so that you remember it later. You need to use a particular strategy so that you remember uh, this information better. Meta comprehension is having that sense of whether I have understood this well or I have not understood this well. These are two uh, abilities. I will uh, limit the discussion in today's class up, uh, to about uh, to only uh, meta memory. Now let us talk a little bit about children's meta memory. Ch meta memory uh, would include how they understand uh, uh, that how memory works. So children do have a sense of the fact that a small set of uh, material uh, or small set of pictures, objects can be remembered better than a larger set. Though children uh, often also have unsophisticated ideas about how their memories might be working. For example, seven-year-olds are not yet aware that words are easily, easily remembered if they are associated to each other as compared to, you know, whether they are randomly selected or not. Also, younger children are not really aware of how to plan an effective study strategy so that they could remember information better. Another meta memory uh, aspect is the f the f awareness of the fact that effect uh, that effort is necessary. It's a very important component because unless you realize that I should put some effort to remember this information later, you're not going to put that effort and you're not going to retain that information for later. However, young children do not ap appreciate the principle. Uh, they are much more likely than adults to keep studying information that they already know and to not uh, you know put. Uh, time uh, properly and put a uh, proper strategy uh, basically to remember something that they have not yet learned. They are also not correct in judging whether or not they have successfully memorized material unless you give them a test and you kind of explicitly tell them that you have scored 20% out of 100% on this task, they will not really appreciate that I have not learned this material. Another interesting aspect about meta memory is the judgment about their own memory performance. In general, younger children are often unrealistically optimistic. You ask them, how was the test? They would say, very good. You ask them, how much do you remember? They would say, everything. And then you give them questions, they will not really be able to answer everything. When they assess their own memory, so younger children are, uh, you know, unrealistically optimistic when they assess their own memory performance, but then older children are slightly more accurate. They are getting better in making these estimations. As children grow up, they become less confident about the answers uh, that might be incorrect. Though it has been demonstrated that even college students are also typically always overestimating the total number of correct answers that they had supplied on a memory test. This is just a graph from a, a, a Rubers and colleagues study from 2004, borrowed uh, from Matt Lynn's book. And you can see that uh, five uh, years in uh, five to six year old and nine to ten year old, the amount of confidence that they report on questions that they had answered incorrectly is kind of decreasing uh, uh, gradually. 
So it kind of just corroborates what I was saying. Now, is there a relationship between meta memory and memory performance? It has been suggested that good meta memory links uh, lead basically good meta memory uh, knowledge or good me meta memory skills leads to choice of better memory strategies and might result in better performance on memory tasks. There is evidence that me meta memory is related to uh, proper strategy use. For example, children with more sophisticated meta memory skills are more likely to use good memory strategies and to use them effectively. However, the correlation between meta memory and final memory performance has been shown to be moderate. So it's it's not does not really the good having good meta memory skills does not always translate to good performance on the task. You have to do a lot of practice and effort as well. So you can therefore conclude that meta memory is moderately related to memory performance. There's not really a very strong one to one link here. Let's talk a little bit about adults meta memory, elder people's meta memory. They have some kind of beliefs about memory, you know, older and younger adults, in some sense there is not a difference because they share very similar beliefs about the properties of memory tasks, what is being tested, how do you learn it, the same fundamental knowledge and about how memory works, which strategies may be useful for you know, remembering this material and what is the material that I can remember better. So there is no real difference between the meta memory uh, skill of belief about memory uh, when you compare younger adults and older adults. Another aspect, monitoring of memory. On some tasks, younger and older adults are equally skilled in monitoring their own memory performance. Older and younger adults are also similar with selecting the most difficult items to remember for further study. So if you've given a material to read to young people and the same material to read for older people, they both will figure out that this part is the most difficult, which I have to rehearse more, spend more effort in remembering for later. The two groups, uh, also perform equally well in judging their own performance and judging their own accuracy when kind of you know answering general knowledge kind of questions and when deciding whether a particular information uh, or particular item is old or new. So they kind of they have the almost equal uh, sense of how well they are doing on a task. However, uh, the elder people, the older individuals are slightly more uh, likely to be overconfident on some memory tasks than others. So that's, that's the difference between monitoring capabilities. Another very important aspect is awareness of memory problems. You know, elderly people, you will see that, you know, people always keep telling them that, you know, you're, you're getting old, your memory is going to get old, you're not going to, you know, this is eventually has to decline. So they also start believing these things. They are more likely to report problems with everyday memory, especially on explicit recall tasks, such as remembering names, phone numbers, so on and so forth. They are also more likely to accept that memory failures have increased over the years. It's, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of uh, self-fulfilling uh, prophecy. They start believing that their memory has gone down, even though research evidence does not really suggest uh, the same thing. On the other hand, some elderly people, however, are, uh, they have this high memory self-efficacy. They are confident, they have that kind of belief in their own potential to perform well on memory tasks. So if you ask them, do you remember that, they will say yes. If you ask them, could you use this information to do that particular task, they would say yes, I have. Uh, I have used that or I am going to use that. So there is this aspect of, uh, you know, uh, memory self-efficacy, this confidence on their own potential uh, that they have done well or that they can do well on a given memory task. Now, in summary, if you just again try and summarize the research on meta memory, uh, research on meta memory reveals that elder, uh, you know, uh, elderly adults and young adults are very similar in some respects when, you know, meta memory is concerned. So this is all from me about the lifespan developmental approach to memory. We talked about memory and differences of memory between uh, young adults and older adults, uh, infants as well. And then we also talked about uh, metacognition capability as meta memory. Thank you. Uh, I think this is the end of the course. Uh, we will talk about something more important in the next lecture. Thank you.